I had meant to have this slide up before Andy came to pray, but um, just a reflection, a little reflection on prayer. Um, it's been um, amazing in the last few days. Uh, Micah has and I were part of the prayer group. We've had some um, WhatsApp messages saying, could we find out more about um, the prayer needs of individuals in the church? Um, somebody in particular said, well, we pray every day, and we, this lady and her husband pray every day. They, they um, set certain days aside for everybody in our church, another day for everybody in their family. Uh, and that was really humbling to me to, to understand that other people in the church, that we don't actually see that often, perhaps. Uh, we don't know them. We know them, but uh, we're not seeing them so much these days, like with everything, uh, that people are praying. Uh, in their own ways, in their own um, <clears throat> homes, uh, consistently, persistently, and lifting up all of us in the church. It's a, that's a, just a, a wonderful testimony. And uh, as we're going to be looking in now at um, those verses from Isaiah that I mentioned, I've been led to, to look briefly into um, a fuller, the fuller passage just before these verses. Uh, and I would say it's been in very interesting. Uh, I wouldn't say it was easy, but um, what I've come up with, I hope it will be of, of some use to us as we reflect on the background to the four wonderful names that are presented in, in Isaiah, <clears throat> uh, verse 6 of chapter 9. So I want to start as, with our reading in, in on page 694. I guess we don't have the Bible, so don't really need that. Uh, Isaiah 8, 11 through to 9, 7. And Isaiah writes, This is what the Lord says to me, with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. Do not call conspiracy everything this people call conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. And do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. He will be a holy place. For both Israel and Judah, he will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble, they will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. Bind up this testimony of warning and seal up God's instruction among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the descendants of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. Here am I and the children the Lord has given me. We are signs and symbols in Israel. From the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. <coughs> Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged. And, looking upward, they will curse their king and their God. They will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. And they will be thrust into utter darkness. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honour Galilee of the nations 
by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice, and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So as I said, I've been led to look briefly into this wider passage um, which leads us up to um, those four majestic names that have been applied to Jesus, that are about Jesus. Uh, we perhaps would be reminded that Isaiah's prophecy was written some between 700 and 800 years before the birth of Jesus. But like the psalm that we read earlier, and as Andy mentioned, the psalm, that psalm is so much about the Lord Jesus and his body not decaying, but him being taken to be with the Lord um, and to live forever. <clears throat> and this prophecy of Isaiah was written at a time when God was about to use the Assyrian nation as an instrument of his judgment upon his own people, Israel. The reason for God permitting such action against Israel was because of his many of its many years of disobedience, Israel's many years of disobedience to his law under the leadership of so many willfully unfaithful kings. So we pick up things in chapter 8, verse 11, <clears throat> with the prophet Isaiah describing the separating out of himself from the people around him. He's God's man. And so he's separated, he's made holy and separated from the world around him, which is very largely sinful. The world with full of worldly inclinations. In verse 12, <clears throat> in verse 12, there's a description of how so many of the people were caught up in ungodly behaviour talking about conspiracies and uh, fears, don't fear what, there's a warning that we shouldn't be caught up in those things. Isaiah is separated, he's being told, he's, being, he's understanding, he's writing God's words that this sort of behaviour is anathema to his God. And as with David in Psalm 16, which we looked at, verse 13 underlines that God's people are only to regard the Lord as holy, to fear him alone and to look at no other, which so many of the others in Israel were doing. The beginning of verse 14 presents the promise that the Lord himself will be the holy place. So here we have the idea of the Lord as a refuge. Um, just again as 
David spoke in Psalm 16 of the Lord as his refuge. So Isaiah speaks of the Lord as a holy or separated place, a place of safety and of protection, a sanctuary. So as we read this, as we read the psalm, this is Isaiah's words from God counselling his people. Isaiah, who's been drawn, has been adopted as one of God's people, and those who are with Isaiah. These are the ones that are separated and made holy, and those are the, those are the ones who have been reminded, like us, to look at our God and no other. Don't be drawn to look towards idols, to spiritual mediums or whatever, for things that you think will help you, things that we think will help us to live more peacefully or more at ease, or that we need to know things about the future that aren't told us clearly in the Bible. We are to look to our Lord and to his counsel. He is our great counsellor. But notice a couple of things in, in verse 14. <clears throat> he, the Lord, will be a holy place. It's a future tense. Isaiah will have known that the Lord was holy. He would have known about God's holiness. But here he's been told to say, he's speaking God's word, that the Lord will be a holy place. This is surely a prophetic promise for the future, pointing us towards the one who would come and bring peace and be entirely holy. But notice too the punctuation after he will be a holy place. And I've separated the word slightly from the next part purposely because the next section really contradicts in a sense the Lord will be a holy place. <clears throat> it's different because for both Israel and Judah God's lands it, Isaiah says that the Lord will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. So this is there's a huge contrast here um, between the Lord as a holy place and the Lord as a stumbling block, shall we say. It signals a gap, the gap between Israel and Judah and the Lord as a holy place and the Lord's people who are following his ways. And Israel and Judah, the two parts of God's split kingdom at that time, This same Lord will be the agent of their <clears throat> downfall. This is hugely shocking, really. And what, it, what sort of harsh and uh, words that will make people stand, sit up and, and take notice. Or they should have done. But these two sides of Israel were going, of God's people were going their own way as we see in verses 14 and 15. Um, <clears throat> the Lord will be their nemesis, the stone that will be their downfall. In verse 16, however, Isaiah turns again to God's people, speaking to God's people, telling them to bind up this testimony. Um, <clears throat> they are to protect and keep it secure this written prophecy from the Holy One of Israel. It is to be held as precious amongst the Lord's followers, those called to listen and to learn from their Lord. In verses 17 and 18, Isaiah's voice, his own voice, it seems, indicates firstly where he patiently stands, where he firmly stands in relation to his Lord. I will wait for the Lord. Patience is there. I will wait. Steadfast faith is there. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the descendants of Jacob, from 
Israel and <clears throat> Judah and those who are not following him. He's hiding his face. He's turning away. They are in a perilous position, those people from whom the Lord is moving, is removing his blessing, is turning his face from them. And Isaiah knows that he and his family are in the privileged position of having been chosen, as we read in verse 18, as indicators of God's just counselling. We are signs and symbols in Israel for the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. His holy judgment is upon those who go separate ways, their separate ways from him, particularly those who had been his people. In speaking God's words in verses 19 and 20, Isaiah <coughs> is virtually mocking those who would seek to find solutions and answers from ungodly sources, rather than consulting the only true counsellor worth listening to. When someone tells you to consult mediums, well, what's going on? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult instead God's instruction and the testimony of warning. But if you don't, if anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light in them. They have no light of dawn. There's no brightness in them. They're in darkness. So he goes on in verse 21. These people are distressed and hungry. They will roam through the land. And then he lists... <coughs> All sorts of things that they will experience. They will become enraged. They will be looking upwards. They will be cursing and so on. They will, they will find only distress and darkness, fearful gloom. They will be thrust into utter darkness. Isaiah paints a really glim, grim picture here for those who go against the Lord. But then we come to the wonderful change around with the word nevertheless at the beginning of chapter 9. This is a big turning point from the dark negativity that we've just been hearing about for those who have turned away from God and from whom he has turned his face. This announces a wonderful promise. In spite of, nevertheless, in spite of what's happened before, what I've just been saying there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. In the future, he will honour Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. So there will be no more distress, no more gloom for those who were in distress. Isaiah's prophecy works in a way I've already touched on with changing times. It intertwines the past, the present, and future. The words for those who were in distress imply that the distress has already passed. So the prophecy, there will be no more gloom, it appears, it seems, before it had even begun to happen. The things that Isaiah is talking about that will happen appear to already have happened, but he also speaks beyond the time, into beyond the time that they have happened uh, when, they have, when things have changed. So God's, here we find God's prophecy through, uh, through Isaiah revealing the distress caused by the Assyrian, that would be caused by the Assyrian invasion that would actually come would be endured, but would eventually be overcome and light would break through. The, company, the accompanying distress would be defeated and would become a thing of the past. Similarly in verse 1 we read of the lands of Zebulun and Naphtali that were humbled in the past. This would in fact become, the, would take place in the future. They would be the first parts of, of the land to be overrun by the Assyrians. 
But in the second part of the verse, <clears throat> Isaiah gives assurance that those areas in the northern parts of Israel, its territories along Galilee, along with Galilee, would be honoured by the Lord. So there was those who were in distress will ultimately be honoured by the Lord. And these prophetic words <clears throat> would later become reality in later history because these places would be among the first to see the great light of Jesus when the Saviour's ministry began in and around Galilee all those centuries later. We see the word he in the... Um, <clears throat> in the two parts of verse 1. He humbled the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, and he will honour Galilee of the nations. <coughs> These he's clearly refer to the God we read about in verse 20 of chapter 8, who should have been consulted by his children for instruction. So we understand that in the past it was he, the Lord, who punished the land and the people, but it is also he, the Lord, who will restore them in the future. Similarly, the combination of the present, the people walking in darkness, in verse 2, with the suggestion of the past, have seen a great light. They've already seen a great light. Great light. They are walking in darkness. And again in the second part of verse 2, God's people of faith are living in darkness, but are already seeing the dawning of the light ahead. So there's this change of things going on in the writing of Isaiah's prophecy. And because they're seeing the light ahead, they are able to be sustained and rejoice at the great hope that this light brings. But this is the light of the word of God. The counsel of the Lord through his prophet is music to the ears of those who love the Lord, but to those who are against him, he is this great stumbling block. But God's kindness in these encouraging promises of illumination in verses 2 and 3, where we see the, the darkness, the illumination breaking into the darkness and the light dawning, and the enlargement that a nation feels and the joy that it feels from an increase in confidence as <clears throat> the, the double use of you here in this, in this verse, you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. The double use of you shows how <clears throat> the writing moves from a gloriously light-filled description in verse 2 to awestruck reflection of the and acknowledgement of God's activity in verse 3. The one, God is the one responsible for the dawning of the great light. And as we move on, the brief mention in verse 4 of Midian's defeat um, comes from Judges chapter 7 when Gideon, um, at God's decree, fought, was told to reduce the size of his army to 300 men uh, and was that they were pitched against the, Midian, the might of the Midian armies and God assured them of victory, which, event, which did come. And this is a symbol of an apparently weak um, people, group of people triumphing over the supposedly stronger oppressors. And with the words, you shattered the yoke, uh, and so on, this mood continues through verse 4 and 5 in recognition of God's destroying of the weapons and clothing of oppression of war and war. Now, these verses recognize God's ability to redeem the people through defeat of the apparently strong enemy by the, a seemingly weaker contender. <clears throat> 
And as the words of verse 6 reveal, that the God-given child deliverer of God's people, an apparently weak and insignificant uh, being, alongside the certainties implied by the phrases is born, is given, these are things that would, be, would happen in the, the, the distant future. And he will be called, well, the, the use of the words for us, all this is for, for God's people. A child is born for us. The son is given to us. It's all future. Although it's being, being uh, spoken of as the, the present. This wonderful encouragement that comes through the word the Spirit would have enabled God's people to see something of the, God, the love that God had for them and the assurance that would come when the one who would have carried the government on his shoulders would finally appear. The one who would be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. So there's wonderful triumphant certainties in the, these words of verses 5 and 6 and uh, this, these latter parts of, um, of this chapter, or these verses, uh, upon this individual, this child, the government, the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign over David's throne and over his kingdom establish and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So the written certainties of the child being born and given to God's people brings the mightiest encouragement uh, of the, in stating the wonderful qualities associated with the government that he would bear on his shoulders and the further majestic qualities epitomized in the names in verse 6. <clears throat> and of course that description runs on into verse 7, and uh, it, the final words there, the seal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this, shows that it's all down to the power, majesty, tenacious desire, of our all-powerful Lord Almighty. What an utterly astonishing announcement this is. The richment, richness of the qualities attributed to this child are breathtaking. What an encouragement to a nation about to be overrun by enemies because of its betrayal to the one true God who had been their protector. But we see in this passage God's instruction to God's people to stand firm with God's word, to stand firm in its truth, to stand firm in the face of <clears throat> much opposition and trends to the contrary in the time when the kings and the rulers of, of, those, of the God's peoples were <clears throat> turning everything away from God worshipping idols and completely um, going against God's ways. And the Assyrian invasions were God's judgment. God was himself was the stumbling block for those people who would bring punishment on the land. But whilst those God's people were, God, <coughs> God's true people, the remnant was still in the land, they have this wonderful encouragement from the words that Isaiah brings. And the future encouragement for all God's people in the prophecies uh, pointing to the, Lord, to the Lord Jesus that we have just uh, <clears throat> sort of looked at and thought about. So I was wondering how to carry on with this, and I don't know how well you can see this, but <clears throat> just a few very brief reflections on the coming of the wonderful counsellor. Even his life in its early days was a, was a counsel to Simeon. Uh, we read about in Luke 
chapter 2, verses 29 to 35, as the baby Jesus was brought to the temple um, by his mother and father. Simeon, this aged um, believer, was astonished at God's kindness to him, saying that he could now die in peace because he had seen the salvation of Israel. So he understood and, and uh, understood who Jesus was. The Lord was counseling to this man who waited patiently for the arrival of the promised Saviour, the wonderful counsellor, who even counsels to him as a child, uh, who counsels to him of God's wonder and care and uh, the assurance that the surety that he would have known as the Son of God, the child, um, to, to be king, came into his presence. And it's no coincidence that Simeon said to Mary, this child would cause the rising and falling of many in Israel. Picking up on that idea of the stumbling block, that the Lord, the good God, the good Lord, would divide, be a divider between God's true people and those who rejected him. We can also perhaps look a little bit further to Luke chapter 2, verse 39 to 40, verses 39 to 40, when the 12-year-old Jesus, having been to Jerusalem with his parents for the celebrations, uh, on their way home they discovered he wasn't with him. <clears throat> they go back to Jerusalem to, to look for him and they find him in the temple discussing with the elders, with these teachers of the law. And everybody who heard him as a 12-year-old was astonished by his understanding. His counsel, his knowledge, his understanding, his ability to listen and to um, communicate in that situation was astounding, was astonishing to all who heard him. And this picture shows him up in the background there speaking with elders, older men, uh, learned men, and yet he is able to counsel them in the truth of the gospel. This is our great, wonderful counsellor who counsels beyond uh, anybody's expectation. <clears throat> and as we think of the way that the Lord Jesus taught with parables, he talked of uh, the, the, the so-called parable of the sower, or the parable of the, parable of the seeds, the seeds scattered by the sower, representing the word of God. They fall where they fall, if they fall on the path, if they fall amongst weeds, if they fall on the amongst rocks, then their roots are not solid. But if they fall amongst those whose hearts are open onto good soil, they will grow and develop and bloom and flourish and bring a harvest. The wonderful counsellor has many ways of speaking to his people all throughout the Bible. We are counselled by his <clears throat> great wisdom. And then in John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11, when the Pharisees and the, the, the religious leaders brought a woman, trying to, to a woman who had apparently been caught in adultery, to Jesus, trying to trap him to see what he would, how he would answer according to the law or according to his own instruction. But Jesus counsels them in a wonderful way. He doesn't say anything. He bends down amongst all the hubbub of their uh, accusations and their demands. He stops everything. It's calm and quiet. They don't know what he, we don't know what he was writing. He writes down on the pavement with his finger. Everybody stops. And eventually he says... Let he who is without sin be the first to cast a stone. He doesn't need to say very much, but what wonderful counsel. Everybody there is astonished. And one by one, starting with the eldest, they, left, they went away and left Jesus, left the woman with Jesus. <clears throat> 
you probably know the story. Another example of patient counselling, wonderful counselling, appropriate to the situation. <clears throat> John 4, 1 to 26, the story of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. Jesus, as a Jew, shouldn't speak to her. He breaks all those conventions. He wants to bring everybody into the kingdom. And he discusses with her. He asks her questions. He gives her honour. He gives her respect. A conversation ensues. And ultimately, she recognises him as the Messiah. She spent time with the wonderful counsellor. This wonderful counsellor who is patient, who is caring, who is open-hearted. And she understood ultimately that he was the Messiah and went off. So full was she with the living water that he gave her that she went off and told her fellow townspeople, fellow villagers. And they were so convinced by her story, they came back and found out for themselves. So her, Jesus coming into her life, she then goes and brings others into his life, into, into, into his counsel. And on hearing his wonderful counsel, they too become believers. Just wanted to show a few examples across the, across the Bible and the New Testament of Jesus as the wonderful counsellor. So just to finish, let's <clears throat> think of Jesus, the wonderful counsellor who came to be amongst the people, who went to be to places where there were many people sometimes. Other times individuals came to him. But here we have this scene of him speaking to the crowds from the boat of the fishermen. Speaking into the crowds who were like sheep without a shepherd. Who is our wonderful counsellor? It is Jesus, isn't it? So three questions perhaps we can take away. How is Jesus our wonderful counsellor? Why do we need a wonderful counsellor? And how do we and how should we respond to our wonderful counsellor? Three questions I think we all can uh, probably respond to and answer, uh, and we might have different ways of doing that. But from the passages from Psalm 16, from Isaiah 8 and 9, uh, that we've looked at this morning, I think the answers are in those <coughs> passages. Read them for yourselves, ponder them. Complexities of Isaiah is perhaps the wonderful uh, beauty of, the, of Psalm 16. All of these passages, each of these passages, and obviously all of the Bible, counsels us to turn to the Lord Jesus, to listen to him, to follow him, to stand firm in our faith. <clears throat> Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this time in it. Uh, thank you for, even though it may be difficult, Father, we thank you that you will, in your mercy, explain it by your spirit to us. Lord, you'll help us to understand. And we thank you that you are our wonderful counsellor. If we humble ourselves to come to you, Lord, uh, to cry out to you, to look to you, that you will bring us the rest the calmness that we that you promise come to me all you who are weary, weary and burdened and i will give you rest so father we thank you for these wonderful promises that we've um, <clears throat> looked into this morning be with us we pray in the name of jesus